Hey guys, chatting with Callie Chamberlain today, all about maternal health and women's health in general, and some startling statistics that are going to blow your mind. One of which blew mine is that we have the worst maternal health system in the developed world. I don't know how that could be, but you're going to find out why in just a minute with Callie. I can't wait to talk to you. Don't forget to subscribe. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we try to do here every single day. Oh, man, do we ever. Our quote of the day, you can have the best education in the world. You can have a safe place to live. You can have a fridge full of food. You can have a job with a paycheck. And none of that matters if you don't have your health. That is from our guest today, Callie Chamberlain. Callie is speaking my language. Right? I know I read that and I was like, yep. I mean, this is my person. <laughs> truly, truly. It's true. Um, hello to our Heel Squad. Thank you guys for being with us each and every day. Today, we're going to be chatting with Callie Chamberlain about maternal health, what it is, why it's important, how her experience as a doula showed her gaps in the system. Then she's going to help us navigate the system and what we can do Um all of us, what we can do to help. So um, I'm super excited about that. She has done some pretty cool stuff, this this Callie. It's uh, it's very admirable. I know. I was reading her stuff like, damn, damn. Yeah, it all just I was mean, like super like, like she's helping everybody and uh, the underserved and the, the people who really need it most. And it was just, it was really cool. I was like, yeah. okay, she's going to win a lot of awards in life. I feel like. No kidding. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited to chat with her. And she's just like, she's such a bright light too. Yeah. I'm like, wow. I'm very, I'm very excited. If you don't have a doula for a friend in life, I need one. Then you have missed out because doulas are amazing. They're like the most nurturing, giving, warm, mushy, amazing humans. Uh, Lori Bregman is my friend and my doula friend. (laughs) She's been on the show so many times. Um, But I really think like when you look at like who you want for friends, find a doula to be friends with because they're incredible, whether you want to have kids or not. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. I'm going to go find myself a doula friend. Yeah. I'm going to make Callie my doula friend. Listen, you need all... Di- like, I think when you look at your friends, you should have all different kinds of friends, right? Like, I have friends who are challenging, which also che- shows me how to deal with challenging people. <laughs> I have friends who um, really push me and challenge me. I have friends who are super nurturing and loving. Like, look, Marcy came over and how sweet is she? She comes over. She the had these sweetest. beautiful gifts made um, in honor of my mom. These like wind chimes with, you know, a little heart with my mom's name and loving memory. And then um, this like little plate that I think I'm going to bring and and put at her grave. Mm. And um, Yeah, she's one of the most thoughtful people. Like all of her gifts, all of like everything. She's just very, very thoughtful. Yeah. I'm like, wow. She's very, very sweet. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and speaking of, she's funny. She's like, I was telling her how um, we're having <sighs> so many issues conceiving or not technically in my body. I think conceiving is when it's for you, but whatever. So many issues <laughs> in the um, category of having children. children yeah. And she was like, well, you can have my womb. I know it's older, but you can have my womb. I'm like, I fucking love you. <laughs> okay. But even the fact that she would even offer that, like, I know. wow. My mom always used to say, Maria, if I could do it for you, I would. Oh. And like my heart would just like melt. Mm, that makes me cry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe Pooja will do it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's sitting here next to me. Pooja, you're young and <laughs> spry. I'm like, who's, who's a young person I know? <laughs> Pooja, how would you feel uh, carrying our twins? <laughs> Pooja's like, do I get maternity leave and a doula? <laughs> you get the doula. Lori is amazing. Because by the way, uh, here's the amazing doula friend of mine. She literally jumped in when she heard like, we're going, we found our surrogate, we were doing it. She's like, I'm there for you every step of the way. I got you. And I'm like, oh my God, I like started crying at the kitchen table. Do you remember we were in Connecticut yeah. when that happened? Yeah. Yeah. Cause we've been doing this for a really freaking long time. Long ass time. Um, I don't know how much more patient I can stay. I, you have been, I mean, like I'm <laughs> seething for you. It's so annoying. Every time you tell me something or up to me, I'm like, uh, like what the hell? What? Like, yeah. So, I mean, you were being very, very, very patient. I mean, Kim was the one who had to tell me 
She's like, Maria, it's been over 10 years. And I'm like, I know it is yeah. not for lack of trying. Yeah. But I just think that I do really believe in the universe. And I really do believe that everything comes when it's time. And so like I look back and if certain jobs had come my way when I wanted them to, or when I thought they were going to, I wasn't ready. Timing is everything. And I would have ruined things. Yeah, interesting. Not ruined things, but I wouldn't have been able to handle them mm-hmm. um, appropriately, I think. Yeah. And so the same thing with kids. Like, could I have really handled having kids while I was taking care of my mom? No. And, you know, some people, no. listen, not everybody goes to the extremes that I went to. And I'm not saying that the extremes I went to were really even quite healthy, but my parents, I always viewed them as my kids. I always said my parents are my kids. And so for me, um, it was important to be that hands-on and be that in it. And, and I'm super grateful as I look back that I was able to. So I definitely could not have handled kids in the yeah. midst of all that. You were no. front row to no. see I mean, the worst, worst parts. Well, but let alone, I think that I've always said, unless you're like, unless you're there, you can't fully grasp or comprehend like ooh, everything you did or everything, you know, that went into it. And I think, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the time. It no. was like... Now, now I'm getting mad. Now, like today, I'm like, it's time now. But, no, but then, but I don't know if it has been time even right now. I think the other agreed. beauty of this, and by the way, if this is a lesson for you and you're impatient about something in your life right now, like I've had, I was telling Kevin just the other day, I'm like, I'm really grateful for this time alone. As much as I am sad that I don't have him to grieve with, um, I'm also grateful that I'm getting this time to really be alone with my thoughts, to not fill it with other things. If he was here, we would be going out. We would be watching TV. We'd be doing all these things. I am literally alone thinking and and digging through feelings and listening to things popping up in my heart and in my mind. and And I'm able to kind of reflect on things, allow for new things to pop in. New things were popping in just yesterday. I was like, oh, yes. But none of that would happen if I'm chasing two two little kids around the house, right? Truly. And so as I build the foundation for my chapter two, because as much as I thought I was doing that these last few years after surgery, I was healing in so many ways and, and just trying to hold on to the lessons the tumor gave me. But I was really in a bit of another tornado. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm able to lay the foundation for my chapter two, which that means when my kids do come, I will be ready to be everything to them. Or not everything to them. Everything to all of us. (laughs) and, and, And you won't feel resentment that you never had time for you. Yeah. And I think that that's like, that's key. I think you're right. Like, this is a lesson yeah. <laughs> for all of us impatient people out there. Yeah. yeah. Everything comes in its time. Yeah. So yeah, you can try to rush it along. I mean, listen, two years ago, or I remember getting like an astrology reading and they were telling me how I was like paying my karmic debts and it's going to suck for the next two years. And like, oh, in April, 2022, I'm like, April fucking 2022. I can't wait for my life to get good until April, 2022. By the way, not saying that my life is bad. I know there are great things as well. Um, But, you know, when you're in this kind of limbo and in this, like, you're drudging through some stuff, obviously I've drudged through a lot of stuff in the last two years. Um, You know, you're like, please, can the sunny days come? The real sunny days, not just the, like, half a sunny day I got down in Malibu. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Um, I mean, the true, like, okay, things are feeling better everywhere in your emotions and in your body. And I was like... Recently, I'm like, oh, April's coming. Yeah, because guys, it's Christmas. Let's let's get <laughs> let's, let's get real, real here. Let's I have my Christmas real. mug. I'm only a morning person on Christmas. <laughs> you know, I have that same mug. Do you? I do. It's everything. Hallmark, Hallmark baby. Is that where I got it from? Yeah. Hallmark. Uh huh. Oh, I can't use a Hallmark mug when I'm a part of a Lifetime movie. <laughs> I'm really sorry to break that to you, everybody. <laughs> Lifetime. Our holiday, your the holiday fix up is our movie. Yeah, it's coming out December eleventh. Mark your calendars. 
Get those DV- DVRs going. <laughs> put it in your calendar. I want you to host a viewing party, and I will retweet your viewing party videos, and we'll do yes. drinking games. I'm going to do Free the most post. massive premiere party here. <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be everything. So we're going to do a live viewing on the tennis court. So I have like the outdoor theater, mm-hmm. the indoor screening room, the bar, and the kitchen family room. All the screens are going to be playing the movie. So and we're going to have everybody everywhere. And we're going to make our cupcakes and cocktails. Love it. And I will eat a cupcake. Hell yeah. Maybe two. I mean, you got to. It's it's Christmas. Yeah. Well, no, look at last Thanksgiving. I know. I true. had just started my no desserts thing and I said no to Michael Chiklis's homemade, what was it, pumpkin pie? Oh, that's right. Or pecan pie. I don't pumpkin. remember. Neither of us had it. It was a it was pumpkin so pie with homemade whipped cream and it was freaking gorgeous. And it's sitting in front of me in my most devastating <laughs> moment of life. Yeah. Right. Both my parents <laughs> are in hospitals with COVID, maybe going to die, terrified. Mm-hmm. And there's that pie. <laughs> and it was going to be so delicious in my mouth. And I just kept thinking to myself, oh, well, you're going through a lot. Just say fuck it. <laughs> just just have it. Just do it. Just do it. And I'm like, but you just started, Maria. And you, you're, you're already on a roll. It's been like maybe a month now. Like you just got to... Mm-hmm. You got to stick with it. Yeah, but you're going through a really tough time. Anybody would understand, especially like what's going on. <laughs> no, no. So I had this like back and forth conversation as you're sitting on the other side of the friggin' folding table in our empty house that Literally. we were living in. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. And so I said no. And so I, I've done really well, but I think cupcakes and cocktails will be will my be next it. moment where I allow, I have allowed two Duncan plane sticks when my mom died. Mm-hmm. I think that's the... You know, the week of all weeks to cheat. And I had a little birthday cake. But Birth. yeah. So Birth December cake. 11th, the holiday fix up. Jana right. Kramer, Ryan McPartland and I, and an entire amazing cast. So fun. Um, I'm super excited. So, all right. Listen, um, from cupcakes <laughs> to health, back to health. Um, let's get into this conversation with Callie Chamberlain. She is committed to communal health and healing as one of the leaders of the Optum Social Responsibility Program. She is responsible for advancing health equity and leading the effort to revolutionize maternal health across their patient populations. Callie <laughs> sits, bless you. Oh, oh yeah. maybe it wasn't a sneeze. Sorry. It was a, <laughs> it was a microphone <laughs> mishap. Um, Callie so sits fun. on several boards, co-hosts one of Apple's top five medical podcasts until it's fixed. And she's a Reiki practitioner, birth and death doula, better together and the Hill squad. Welcome you, Callie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you today. Oh, me too. Me too. Where are you coming to us from? I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, I didn't know you were definitely there, but I know you're from there. Um, yeah. So tell me about um, your work in maternal health, where did the kind of spark come to go down this path and then take it to where you've taken it? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, I am adopted and I had some friends that wanted to think about adoption. And so I was sharing my personal experience with them and also wanting to make sure that if there were additional things I could do to support them, that I was exploring those avenues That search led me to learn about what it means to be a birth doula, which is someone that supports a pregnant person through the experience of oftentimes infertility or getting pregnant, being pregnant, labor, and delivery. And so training and learning how to do that really opened my eyes to so many different things and um, really helped me understand that my role at Optum could play a role in also, you know, fixing some of the things that exist within the health system around maternal health. Um, All of that together, I think, brought us to this point today where now we have this amazing strategy addressing maternal health. We're doing a lot of work in communities, and it's been an amazing experience to be able to bring my personal, the spiritual dimension of this work and my professional work all into one sphere and be able to do all of it together. So what is Optum? Yeah, that's a great question. So Optum is one half of United Health Group. It's a products and services company. And it provides products and services to one out of 10 babies that are born in the United States every year. So 
it has a huge role to play in this space and also um, supports UHC, which is the insurance side of the house. Got it. And so why does maternal health matter? Yes, it's a great question. So um, maternal health in the United States is the last out of any developed nation. We have the worst health outcomes for birthing people. Unreal. Um, We spend the most, unreal. Um, We we spend the most amount of money and we also have the least social services available to support families and birthing people, which results in some of these outcomes, which is really crazy when you think about that. Um, what a crisis this actually is. That being said, it's bad across the board. It's especially bad for birthing people of color. And I'm using this term birthing people instead of women um, because it's a more gender inclusive term that encompasses non-binary people, trans people, all kinds of people that have uteruses and can have children. And so if you think about the disparity that exists within our health system, specifically for those groups, what we know is that if you are a Black or Indigenous birthing person in the United States, you have a higher likelihood of dying in childbirth than a U.S. soldier has of dying in combat. What? So their outcomes are four to six times worse, yes, um, than, than white birthing people, which it's still bad for. Wait, so here's the thing, Kelly. We live in the U.S. of A., we have fancy hospitals. We have everything you can imagine. How, how is it that we have the war system? What is it that makes our system so bad? Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of things in their systems within systems when we think about health. And so I think part of the challenge is also just how narrowly we're thinking about maternal health. We need to think about women's health being a spectrum. And maternal health is one part of that spectrum. So if we are not prioritizing women's health across this country, if we're not talking about things like access to care and being able to pay for that care and having that be really quality, we're already going to be running into challenges. And that was a really important part of thinking about this work. I'd talk to providers and OBGYNs and they would say things like, you know, I'm working with people who are coming to me that are already sick. They're already maybe not coming consistently and I only see them when they're pregnant. And so already, right, if that's the case and then they're pregnant, we're working backwards Mm -hmm. against some of these morbidities and mortalities that are possible. So I think the state of healthcare, the priority around women's health are problematic when we think about maternal health. There's also something called the social determinants of health, which is coming into the lexicon of health language and essentially means that, you know, 80% of what determines our health status is happening outside of the four walls of a care setting. And that's things like, do you have access to transportation? Do you live in a safe space? Do you have healthy food at home? Are you living in a safe environment where you can walk outside and feel safe and exercise? If you don't have those things, it's harder for you to be healthy. And what we know about those social determinants of health is that they disproportionately impact people of color. So all of those things together really, you know, kind of show up with these outcomes that we're talking about in maternal health. Wow. So I just made a correlation. And by the way, this is just popped into my pea brain now. I have not thought it through. So don't anybody come get me for my, you know, little (laughs) thought here. But I think that women's health is an issue, whether you're rich or poor, right? Because when you are like, because I look at more affluent women and the women who are hustling for their careers and like, first of all, like our, our only focus in life is to be successful, right? Generally speaking, we're like taught from a young age, you got to make something of yourself. You got to go get a great job, whatever. And I watch so many of us be so focused on our careers and not our health. So yes, we might have more Mm. access, but we still don't use it. Right. So across the board, women are told and taught from a young age to neglect themselves and, um, and that they have to be last. And so Yes, obviously, you know, if you have less and I grew up with less and I know what it was like for my parents and for us growing up, um, it's challenging. And then now the language barriers and stuff that we had to deal with, it was, you know, I don't know how we got through, but 
Mm-hmm. I think it's just an overall problem in women's health in general that we we have this kind of like foundation of we don't matter, we don't mm-hmm. have time, um, we're too busy, um, we got to take care of everybody else. And so I do think that even when you have more, some of the time that we're, we're not even u- utilizing what we have and then forget when you have nothing and you don't have access, I mean, you're just kind of in this like, you know, kind of hopeless situation. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense to you, but I was just kind of thinking about that. I'm like, wait, I think this is just an overall women's issue. Absolutely. I mean, I think you're bringing up really important points that also add to the complexity and the layers that exist within this space, right? And so what I'm hearing you say is like, we have priorities that are things other than our health. Mm-hmm. And we might question ourselves. Ooh, I think something's wrong, but I'm not sure. I think it will be okay. I'm Let crazy. me just keep going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you're going to talk to a doctor and your doctor is making you feel like everything is fine mm-hmm. or nothing is really there and you're doubting yourself. Um, all I think all of those things together can be really challenging. We also think a lot about health literacy as doulas, which is the the medical information that might be provided to you is also confusing mm-hmm. or you're you're misunderstanding things and you're taking medication at times that maybe isn't the right time. Yep. There's lots of things that can come into p- play that really complicate the experience around health, especially for women. Callie, you're my person. Oh my God. <laughs> so this is all the stuff that I'm like so passionate about and I talk about so in depth. And we started with your quote about you can have the best education, a safe place to live, food in the fridge. You can have a job with a paycheck, but none of that matters without your health. I've mm-hmm. been screaming a version of that from the rooftops ever since I um, had to deal with my brain tumor, my mom's brain tumor and realizing like how precious health is and how much we disregard it. Um, and I think, you know, for me and my family, health was always important because my dad was type one diabetic. Mm. But what I saw with him is exactly the pain points you're talking about. My parents didn't speak English. And when they did, it was obviously their second language and very challenging. You're going into these doctors. You don't have translators, or we didn't back then. You're trying to make sense of it. You're so nervous, and you're they're very obedient, compliant, like submissive. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. They just kept saying, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And they would leave, and I'm like, do you even know what they said? No, what? Uh. And so I had to take over their health at some point. Um, mm. And I realized that... My dad didn't understand the messages. So when they said, don't eat sugar, he cut out all sugar, which meant carbs as well. You know, you need some glucose to the brain. Yeah. And he did manual labor, cleaning nightclubs and installing carpets and things like that. He never had enough energy source to sustain the work he was putting out. So the, the you know, intake wasn't enough for the output and his sugar would drop and crash and he'd almost die every friggin' day. But that was now the new Mm. system and that was like normalized. But that was until I was able to jump in and say, okay, no, we need to get like a team. We need to figure this out. We need to really understand this. Um, But it's really hard for people. And I always feel so bad if, um, if there's, you know, a language barrier or, and especially if you're a female, you're just off the bat crazy when you go into the doctor and you think you have something and, and you have this inner knowing and they keep challenging you. And so it's really easy to give up and say, well, they're the doctor, they know better. Um, there, it is a really complex situation, medical, the medical system in our country. They, I know they do their best, but it's still like really not great. (laughs) Yeah. Navigating it is so challenging. And you know, one of the things I always say is that the health system was created at a time when women were not considered human beings, much less women of color. They were not Mm -hmm. in the lexicon of what was possible. And so you think about that origin and you think about the way that the system exists. It's no wonder that we're here, right? It's no wonder that it's challenging because it was designed to function the way that it functions. And so we, it's important for other care supports like doulas to be available and support and navigate like you were doing for your father. And also for us to think about ways in which the system can work differently to start to change some of those outcomes. Yeah. What I think about with your story is, you know, one in five people report discrimination and racism in the healthcare system. I'm one of those five people too. I had a, um, a benign tumor in my arm And I went to the doctor and I asked him, like, what do you think that this is about? Why do you think that this got there? And his response to me was, 
I don't know, why is the sky blue? I don't think that that was an inappropriate question for me to ask <gasps> about you informing me that I have something in my arm. <sighs> and it wasn't until a couple of years later when I went to go see a chiropractor who was like, okay, this is a lipoma, um, which means it has little legs that sort of wrap around your veins. And he was like, it's it's non-cancerous, but you really should get it taken out because it can grow and cause other types of problems. But it took him, who is outside of a traditional care setting, if you think about a doc, you mm-hmm. know, traditional doctor, who was helping guide me to make decisions about my health. And so all that to say, I think it's really important to, <clears throat> like you're saying, feel empowered. You're, you know what is going on. Yeah. If you have any inclination that something is not right, you have to follow that and to seek potentially outside support to be able to think more holistically about your health so that you can guide yourself within the health system. So this is so crazy This is that we're talking about this today. So just yesterday, in my moments of silence, I had this like moment that popped into my head and it said, health life coach. And I was like, mm. what? And I was like, oh, maybe I should be doing some of that because I'm kind of doing it anyway every day. And then I woke up this morning and I'm like, I joke about how I have all these different patients. <laughs> I'm like, I I'm a it. fake doctor. I like, <laughs> but what I'm doing is I'm helping people advocate for themselves. I'm helping people see the holes in the system and I'm helping people see that there's another way usually that they haven't thought about because everyone's just so scared and they give their power over away to a doctor they don't know. And they say, I trust you. And they've got 20 minutes with you. And then they never think about you again. And you think that they're God, they're going to know everything from your blood. They, you think they're just going to know period. And they just don't because they only know what you tell them. And they only know what the body shows them. Um, it really is an investigation. And so I started realizing, I'm like, Oh, I think I might do some of this because it really like lights me up to help people um, on that journey. So it's kind of funny we're talking about this right now, but it's not. That's just the universe. (laughs) Exactly. Um, I was going to say. Yeah. But I think think that um, I wonder if you think that in other countries, because like obviously we're a melting pot, right? So there's so many different kinds of people here. In other mm-hmm. countries, you know, it's not as diverse, let's say. Everyone kind of speaks the same language. I wonder if in those countries it's easier because of that, right? So they're not dealing with like language barriers and they're not dealing with, um, like in Greece, right? Everyone's primarily Greek. They're going to go to the doctor. Everyone's going to understand each other. And maybe it's a better system because of that. Maybe is that why we have such a tricky time? I think it's a lot of different things. I mean, that could definitely play a role. I think there's also just different expectations of lifestyle, different pacing of life, where maybe providers are spending more time with their patients. Maybe patients are living their lives in a way that is less stressful, Mm -hmm. right? And so they're already accessing different kinds of health. Maybe they have their social determinants of health met because they're living in environments where some of those things are more accessible. I think a lot of things sort of play into that experience. The big thing that I think about Um, I'm really interested in communal health and healing. And so thinking about the individual practice, even like I shared training as a birth doula, applying those principles to communities. And so I think a lot of our healing and our health is so individualistic in this country because Mm -hmm. that's how we think. But really you look at other countries and they're so communal. They're with each other all the time that I think that that also plays a really important role in people's health and their health status and also the care that they're receiving, right? So even the doula practice that actually evolved out of, it's, it's like basically bringing that tradition back to mm-hmm. the way that we used to be, which is living in communal settings. Today I go and I'm, you know, hired as a birth tool and I'm going to support someone throughout labor and delivery. If this was, you know, a hundred plus years ago, I would be just a village auntie yeah. that had the experience and was sharing it with people and with them and supporting them. And that's kind of the way that we lived our lives. And so getting back to some of that, I think, is also present in other cultures in a way that might not be present here. Yeah. So explain the individual versus communal, because I keep trying to teach people that they're individual and that the kind of standard of care is is a little dangerous, right? You have to know what's right for your body and what's right for you and, and everyone's individual. So then when you say the communal part, I want to make sure we understand um, what you mean specifically by that. Yeah, that's a great point. And what I mean by communal is we all live in environments together. And so if one of us is living in an an environment that's not safe, 
my guess is that our neighbors are also not safe. Mm -hmm. If we are living in a neighborhood that doesn't have an accessible grocery store with fresh fruits and vegetables, we're all being impacted by that. If we're living isolated and not in community with one another and thinking about each other and engaging, that also impacts our health. And so it is super important that you understand who you are and how to navigate a system and also wrap a community of people around you who can support you, who can maybe pick up your groceries if you can't go, who can drive you to the doctor's appointment. All of those things are really important when we think about, you know, being healthy and actually living a life where we can thrive. That's why I want to move to Nashville. (laughs) I I swear I'm yearning for that communal feeling where like people are together and they care about each other. Like in LA, it's very um, siloed, right? Everyone's chasing their dreams and so in their little funnel that they can't even look to the side. And, um, and I think that I, you know, probably in COVID, a lot of people have really realized how important that is because when we were isolated, all we had was maybe our neighbors to see like on the grass from far away, social distancing. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So, so back to maternal health being the worst in this, in the world, in this country, right? You said the U S is ranked the worst of any developed nation of any developed nation. So Callie, what, um, Why do, or what can we do to kind of start to mend the issue of maternal health in this country? Is there something that we can all collectively do? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that all of us have a sphere of influence and control and being able to think about where we have the intersection of that and how we can center equity, think more broadly about health, think more expansively about maternal health, and lean into those opportunities is really important. Because like we're talking about, this problem is so dynamic, it's so complex, that it really will require everybody to kind of be operating and thinking from that mentality. And even if that's just at the individual level, advocating for yourself, asking different kinds of questions, you know, looking for additional supports in your community or through doulas to be able to guide you through a system, all of those things are helping to move us in the direction that we need to be moving in. The other thing I'd say is if you're working at an organization, thinking about ways that you can do this work authentically is so important. Um, Like I described, being a birth doula and training And then thinking about where we had an opportunity as we are uniquely positioned in this space and then developing a strategy and pitching it to our board and saying, I think we have a real opportunity to do something here that builds on the legacy of our work. It was a little bit of a risk, but we were able to make it this incredible initiative and work in communities and provide funding and pro bono consulting support to advance really important work that's happening in this space. And so... I, I, again, all of us have like some area where we're able to think differently about how we're showing up and centering these issues. And if we're all able to do that, I think it's only going to mean great things for us and for health. I love it. So Forbes wrote an article on you highlighting how you used your experience training as a birth doula and turned it into a Fortune 10 maternal health strategy. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, I think it was just, you know, learning about my own experiences, reflecting on being adopted and my experience, you know, being disconnected from my birth parent and what the impacts of that were. And then learning that Optum provides products and services to one in 10 babies that are born in the United States every year and seeing that that was my overlap. That was my intersection where I had an opportunity to think about how we could show up differently in those spaces. And so, It's interesting because being a birth doula, you learn about what a spiritual experience birth actually is. It's not a medical event. It's a deeply spiritual one. The veil is so thin, right? You're supporting somebody who is moving from a spiritual realm into a physical realm. And so that experience and being in the delivery room to witness it, it changed my life. And I just remember thinking everybody deserves to have this type of experience. And so if I'm at Optum and I'm working in the social responsibility program, I think the responsible thing for us to do is to make sure that that happens. 
And for me, that means looking at all of the administrative business side of healthcare, like we're talking about, and making sure that we can make that as simple and easy and clear as possible so that providers can show up in a space and have that type of relationship with patients. And on the flip side, that we're working in communities, that we're supporting health literacy and patient navigation and doula support and all of these other things that support the individual. So that when they're in the room together and they're about to have a child, that spiritual experience can really come through. So are you guys working to provide doula services for the underserved? Yes, we are through a number of different kinds of programs. One of the ones that we just supported is um, a program called Ladies of Hope Ministry that's based in New York City. In today, there's 23 states that um, it's fully legal and common practice to have a woman who is incarcerated or a birthing person who's incarcerated be physically restrained while giving birth. That is the exact opposite of what we've just described of a spiritual wow. experience. Oftentimes, the first person that the baby and the birthing person is seeing is a prison guard. And so we Whoa. went to work with that community. Yeah. And said, We would never think this of this. Is- would you ever think about that? I never thought about what it would be like to be never. giving birth incarcerated. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's horrifying. And so being able to work with a person who was formerly incarcerated herself, she wanted to launch a doula program to train incarcerated people to be able to train to be doulas so that when they were released, they were able to have a source of economic income, be in their communities, support other birthing people, but also to doula each other while they were incarcerated if there was someone else that was pregnant. We worked with her in another program called Mama Glow to train 40 um, people to become doulas that are incarcerated or system impacted. So that's one of the ways in which we're showing up in that space and learning about how we can provide those types of supports. What I'll also say is that stepping back, if you think about exactly your comment, like who even knew this was happening? Like, this is so crazy. There's a lot of spaces like that where there's niche populations that are not having their needs met that are really vulnerable and very high risk. We're working with another group that's in North Carolina, the Wake Forest Baptist Health System, to support um, birthing people who are pregnant and experiencing intimate partner violence Mm. to be able to make sure that they have their supports needed while they're pregnant to be able to, you know, hopefully have a healthy delivery and support themselves after the birth of their child. But these are the pockets of folks Mm. that exist that our system is just missing. And so being able to work with those populations to launch different kinds of pilot programs that we're hopefully going to scale across the country as best practices, that's how we center equity in everything that we're doing around maternal health. Going to the ground. These are, again, these are the pockets. Who are the people that are leading in the spaces? Mm. How do we then show up as the second largest healthcare company in the world to say, we want to learn from you. We want to work with you. Tell us how we can best support the work that you're doing. And then let's put it all together and make sure that we can really revolutionize this space. Yeah. Wow. Definitely would have never thought of that. Um, That's why I love this because, you know, every day our eyes are open to something new. Um, You know, I I think that there was a a really great documentary that Ricky Lake made on um, the business of being born. I'm sure you've seen it. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, and she talked about obviously how challenging it is to, to give birth and have that spiritual experience in the hospital as opposed to at home. Um, do you have a preference on where you doula? I think it's up to the the person and what they feel most comfortable with. And there are a lot of people who feel more comfortable being in a care setting where they know that they have doctors available and all of these different supports, if anything were to go wrong or potentially they're high risk and it maybe is not in their best interest or their desire to birth at home. And then I have a lot of clients who that's their primary choice, right? Mm -hmm. They feel much more comfortable being able to move around and be in their own space. They want to have candles. They want to have music. They want to, you know, have other types of things that support them. And I think the options are really important for people because it is such a meditation. You need to be in a headspace. You have to feel like you're one with your body And if you can't do that in a care setting, which for some people might be a traumatizing setting, Mm -hmm. then a hundred percent, it makes sense that you probably birth at home. Yeah. Callie, I can't think of a scarier job. (laughs) Well, no, there are some other scary jobs I could think of, but the idea of being a doula sounds so terrifying to me because especially if you're going to do an at-home birth, right? If you're in a hospital, you know, you've got your backup, right? But 
man to doula somebody and and get help them give birth at home and having that responsibility in your hands is it as terrifying as i am assuming and feeling right now I don't know. It's funny you say that actually, because when you were talking about being a health coach, I was like, maybe you should be a doula. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So typically a doula is part of a care team. So there's also like a midwife or another provider that's actually there facilitating the physical birth experience. I I love it um, because you're able to provide the emotional, spiritual support for somebody. You're able to help them navigate their decisions you're helping to provide alternatives. You're just helping to facilitate the experience and the setting. And so if you think about yourself as being able to just sort of like wrap your arms around the two people that are having this experience, if they're partnered to have their child, it's such an honor and a gift to be able to be in that space and to be trusted with the navigation of that. And so I oftentimes just think about it as being in service to and making sure that my client is supported and has everything that they need, that they feel good. I don't know everything about birth, but if there are questions, I can figure out the answers and we'll do it together. It's just making sure that someone feels supported and witnessed throughout the transformative Mm -hmm. experience of birth because it is so defining. And oftentimes I think birthing people have a child. It's all about the baby. And they sort of feel like, what about me? Like I just had this incredible experience and I need some support and love too. And so I, it it is a little scary, but it's also such an honor and it's such a privilege. Better together. Better together. That's right. Yeah. I, I think, um, my mom had a really, uh, horrible, horrible, um, experience with her first baby. So that that's, I think where my terror comes from because she carried the baby to term and on Christmas day, the umbilical cord choked her. Oh, wow. And on Christmas friggin' day. And so to me, I think of like all the things that could go wrong. So do you ever get nervous as a doula? Like, are you ever nervous of the things that could go wrong? And, and then can somebody get there fast enough? That's always the question of, do I do it at home or do I do it in a hospital? Right. It's for that specific moment. Yeah. And there are birthing centers too, where people can have like a hybrid mix of both where there's, you know, medical staff available if something were to go wrong. It is always a concern. And to disregard that would be to disregard the entire front end of our conversation where we're talking about how scary it is to give birth in the United States, Mm -hmm. especially if you're a person of color. So those concerns are very valid. And when I work with people, they're they're worried, yeah. right? I just had a conversation with someone the other day. We were talking about Serena Williams. She's one of the best athletes in the world. She knows her body better than anybody. And she almost died during childbirth mm-hmm. because she was not believed about some of the complications that existed for her. So it, it it's a reality that exists. And I think you know, it really is about making sure people feel comfortable to get into that meditative state. So it might be better for someone who's really worried about that to give birth in a hospital or a birthing center where those types of medical supports are available in case something goes wrong. Yeah. But if you're with a a midwife and you're at home, you feel comfortable, you're healthy, you know, it, it can make a lot of sense to have a baby at home as well. Yeah. It looks like the most special way to do it. I remember watching that documentary and I kept rewinding when Ricky had her baby because I was like (laughs) sobbing and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Um, And so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a really special moment to be a part of and to, to see. So um, I've only gotten to see it through Ricky's documentary, but I think, uh, I think that's probably why you love your job so much. I mean, to, to help somebody give life is crazy. Yeah. And I think using that as a guide for the work that I do at Optum is so important because it's easy then for me to stay grounded in what is my why? Mm -hmm. Why is this important to me? Why does this matter? I can look at the numbers and I'm motivated by that, but to see the spiritual experience up close just makes me realize how important it is for us to do this work at scale. Because again, everybody deserves that experience. I love it. Well, Kelly, you're doing some really incredible work. Um, and an admirable work. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time to educate us on, uh, these gaps and kind of what's really going on out there. Um, so, uh, actually I have one last question for you <clears throat> as somebody who is so focused on helping everybody with their health journey. Um, have you 
adjusted your health journey along the way to focus more on yourself and make it more of a priority? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think what I realized, especially in the pandemic, was I had a very humbling moment to realize that I needed to release. And I think we are so rewarded for the control and the like type A sort of mentality. And it just, I realized last year, this is not working for me. I am so stressed. I am not well. And I think I need to change my mentality of how I'm engaging in my community and my work. And that mental shift changed everything for me. Um, And so now I really make it a priority with so much of my work that is relationship-based and being in community, building trust, building relationships. I have to show up as my best and highest self. And that requires an emotional, spiritual capacity. So I know I talk a lot about that, but it's so important. I have a whole morning routine that I do for two hours every morning. I'm very mindful of how I move through my day, how I'm showing up, because that's what matters to me is the connection that we get to have with people in those relationships. And if I'm not showing up that way, ready to go, then, then what, right? Then I'm not doing the things I need to do for myself and I'm not honoring the relationship with another person. Whoa, Callie, hold on. Part two of the interview. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> two hours every morning. So you're yeah. obviously a type A overachiever. Okay. We know this. Um, <laughs> how did a t- type A overachiever actually carve out two hours every single day and yeah. when, and what does that look like? Yeah. It's, it's so funny. Cause I actually don't think about myself as uh, I have integrity to the things that I say that I'm going to do, but I don't punish myself. I don't shame myself. I don't guilt myself into doing things. Okay. So also there are days when I don't do the two hours, I do what I have available to me or I'm not in a headspace to do it. And I don't do it at all. So I think that that's the other thing is just learning to mm-hmm. like, moderate my mood and understand that everything's okay. And I just have to adjust a little bit to make sure that I can get to where I need to be. Um, But for me, it looks like waking up, I meditate, I pray, I talk to my grandmother, um, I might light a candle, I read a book, I go for a walk, I have coffee, I listen to a podcast, I stretch, and then I'll open up my computer and know what I need to do for the day. Whoa. Okay. What time are you waking up to do all of this? It depends on the day, but maybe like seven. Wow. How mm-hmm. inspiring. It is insp- I'm like, that's attainable. <laughs> that's attainable. That's doable. <laughs> right? You still yeah. have to be here at nine, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start with an hour. <laughs> um, I love that. I mean, I kind of do my variation of that too. It doesn't take up that much time, but I am giving myself my morning to get ready with ease and Mm. have my breakfast, make my coffee. My coffee is my ritual in the morning. I sniff my grinds and feel good. And then most of the time I'll go outside and like breathe and thank God for the amazing day that's coming and all of it. But, um, but I love hearing, um, everybody else's journey to kind of finding their ritual or finding their way to make themselves important because also, When you're a nurturer, and I said at the top of the show, if you don't have a friend who's a doula, you need to have one. I have a friend who's a doula. I'm now going to make you my friend, Callie, because I love love you and I love your (laughs) spirit. Um, So we're friends. You just didn't know it. Um, And I think that you're so busy nurturing and giving that you're usually the one that's actually going to be the biggest, um, uh, um, gosh, what's the word for like the most guilty of not taking Mm. care of yourself. Right. Yeah, that's true. And I think I needed to learn that lesson too, is that I was giving to so many people from something I didn't have. Mm -hmm. I was taking from future me to give to somebody else. (gasps) And I had resentment about that. I needed to stop and recognize, yo, I can't do this. Like I, I don't feel well in my relationships. And if that is the most important thing to me, and I'm bringing resentment into that because I'm not in a relationship with myself that's not going to work. Right. And so I really had to stop and analyze how am I using my time and energy and where do I need to focus? And it's one of those things that I think everybody hears, but it doesn't actually mean something until you make it mean something for you, which is that you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. You have to come first. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that, but it really took those moments to recognize 
okay, I understand what that means now. Yeah. Like now I need to have a deeper conversation with myself about what that looks like for me. Wow. Taking from future me. Do you know how much I took from future me? I took like 20 years of future me. Yeah. Holy shit. I love that. I always say that I went from human doing to human being. Mm, I love that. And most recently, because I, I, I feel like I'll get going and then I'm just dead again. I'll get going. I'm just dead again. I'm like, oh my God. I've been a car on empty and mm. I just keep bumming five bucks from people. I mean, like, can I, can you spot me five for gas? Yeah. And they'll put five bucks of gas in. I'll start going and then psh, dead again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that metaphor. Actually, that's really powerful. And I think, I mean, I have that too, where I'll like start and stop, but I don't know that that works for me anymore. Yeah. Like I want the sustainability. I want to just, I love that you use the word ease. That's what I think about all the time. What's just the most, the easiest thing. Yeah. Even if it's not simple, can it be easy? Probably. Right. Yeah. But we're and trained so, that nothing good comes unless it's like crazy hard and very yeah. intense and. Uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. But also like, again, the last year where I've just had to release things have never been better for me in so many different ways. And I think that that is absolutely correlated, at least in my experience, to having that ease and letting go of that idea that it has to be a struggle. It has to be intense. Mm -hmm. It has to be all consuming. That is like burnout city for me. Yeah. Very 20th century. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, Callie, if you're ever in LA, you have to let me know. I I definitely will. This was such a good conversation. Thanks. I I feel the same way. And um, if you guys want, you can check out uh, her show on Apple Podcasts. It's called Until It's Fixed. Um, It's top health podcast on um, Apple Pod. We'll link it in the description. Of course, um, we'll also link the website for Optum to learn more about health equity. It's optum.com and of course, Instagram at optum and at CK Chamberlain. We'll put all of that in the summary as well. All right, Callie, have an amazing day. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. All right, guys. Woo. Really? Taking from future me. Yeah, that that got me. Wow. Crazy. Because I always say I help future me. If like, I'm always, if I'm stoked, I'm like, nice, past me, helped future me by whatever, Mm -hmm. making my coffee for the next day. Who knows what, but taking from future me. Yeah. I took a lot from future me in life. I feel like I have too. I'm like, need to check that. That's wild. Yeah. Also, just how crazy is this? All of this, all of this. I mean, it's, it's always blown my mind how little support women get, um, like, you know, with maternal leave, with this, but it's just like, my God, this is something that definitely needs to be addressed and fixed. So I thought this was such an important conversation. Yeah. I mean, we, I think the health system, like anything, listen, we're all trying. Everyone's trying. It's just that it, you know, women (laughs) think of how women have been treated in, in, you know, in life, right? We're, we're still not equal paid. Like we're not, we're not there yet. (laughs) So, um, you know, we're still having to tell people not to grab our asses and truly, I mean, it's (laughs) like, we're, we're, we're not there yet. (laughs) So everything is going to take its time, but it is kind of shocking. And I just wonder if like, you know, if some of the things that make our country so beautiful also make it really challenging too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, um, who knows? All I know is we can all just keep trying and learning and growing. And now we're aware of so many more things that we weren't aware of. I could never have imagined that. I I guess I never thought of someone pregnant incarcerated either. Oh my gosh, I know. And then the first, and then you're tied down to give birth. Mm -mm. And then on top of it, the first person that's seeing your baby is a prison guard who's probably like done inappropriate things. Sorry. I'm sure there are a lot of amazing prison no, guards. But it's but. scary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really awful and traumatizing for both the mom and the baby. Like, oh, makes so, me sick. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, um, I really, really enjoyed that conversation. And um, yeah, she's awesome. I want to listen to that, their podcast. Yeah. I'm like, I want to keep learning. Yeah. So I don't cool. think I'm going to be a health doula, but I do think that <laughs> yeah. um, I might do some health life coaching because I, it hit me yesterday. Like it was so funny that I was like, wait, I'm already coaching people through things. I have been just, just because I don't want all this knowledge to just go to waste. I want to be able to help people who are suffering. 
and I know so much more about how to navigate the system. So maybe I will start health coaching. I think you should. Like, it's like I'd be your health buddy. Health, I like that. Health friend, health BFF. Health buddy. That's cute. Health buddy. I like that. Remember, you wouldn't remember, there was, um, I think it was a doll called My Buddy. My buddy, Mm -mm. my buddy, wherever I go, he's gonna go, my buddy. (laughs) No. My buddy. Mm -mm. So. mm -hmm. But I love it. We'll have to, we'll have to YouTube it later. Health buddy. Um, So maybe I'll be your health buddy so that you have some, someone who's a badass who's like, no, go back and tell them this, Mm -hmm. which I've done with you where I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, go back and you tell them X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You ha- I mean, you need someone, especially when you're first getting into it, like me with my stomach stuff. I'm like, I think doctors are God. So I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. But uh, no, express yourself. You're not crazy. So it was, I mean, it's it's nice to have someone who's been through it, who's like, hey, no, you are actually okay to say that. You go tell them that. You tell them how you feel. You yeah. know, don't take no for an answer. Everyone needs that, especially women who everyone thinks we're crazy. Maybe I'll give you my first testimonial. There you go. I'm happy to be. Thank you. Happy to be. All right, guys. (laughs) If you want me to be your health buddy, let me know. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) You're going to get a lot. Um, And uh, make sure you guys hit subscribe. And if you can, leave us an Apple podcast review. I live for them. They're like my gifts. So if you could ever give me a gift, it's that. Um, and, uh, follow us on Instagram at better together with Maria. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices and be present.